Good evening, my dear fiends. Good evening. And welcome to a pre-Halloween special. That's right. It's only a week or so away from Halloween itself. So I thought you know, I would show yet another uh, spine-tingling episode to get yourself in the mood. Well, tonight's not about vampires or Count Dracula, but it does have Bela Lugosi in it, and it's called Scared to Death. Ah, Scared to Death, Boris. You know, this film has, well, it's being told by the view of the dead person. That's right, it's some, somewhat of a semi-mystery horror uh, type film. And, of course, Bela Lugosi is the horror part. <laughs> Indeed. So, well, get yourself in the mood. Turn down the lights. Get someone next to you. Snuggle close, right, Boris? <laughs> and uh, let's go into it. Let it, me uh, tune in to my internet haunted uh, typewriter. That's right, scared to death. Bela Lugosi, around 1940s, I believe. Oh, it's also one little tidbit. This was Bela's first and only appearance what, with a color film. You're in for a treat. So let's tune in to the old internet haunted TV for Scared to Death with Bela Lugosi. I'm coming for you. <laughs> I've been watching you. Yes, Doctor. And the police are particularly anxious that the cause of death be determined at the earliest possible moment. It's a pity. She was a very beautiful woman. One hates to perform an autopsy on a beautiful woman. But you've no other choice, Doctor. Most unusual. There are no marks of violence on the body. What do they suspect? Poison? Have they any idea? My understanding is, Doctor, that the authorities are entirely at sea as to how she was killed. They know why, but, uh, and they also have the fellow who killed her. But... Yes, yes, that doesn't matter. That's none of our business. Our business is to find out what killed her. And yet, one often wonders, what could have caused the last thought that was cut off by death? If it was spoken now, what would it be? If you're here, you found me at last. But you know what you kill me. I want you. Don't come up there. No, don't, please. Don't. Ah! No, I told you I didn't want the bandage. Why, Laura? Why are you so opposed to the bandage? Does it remind you of something, perhaps? What do you mean? Oh, nothing, Laura, nothing. Now, won't you lie down again and let me complete the examination? You're a sick girl, you know, in a highly nervous condition. I want to know what you meant by saying the bandage reminded me of something. If you don't know, how should I? You don't fool me for a minute, Doctor. I know how you feel about me. Do you, Laura? Then I wish you'd tell me, for I don't know. 
I don't know how I feel about you at all. You're clever, Doctor. But I'm wise to you and that fool of a son of yours. How long have you been married to Ward now? Too long. And why don't you give him his divorce? He's asked you often enough. I'll give him a divorce when I'm good and ready. I see. I'm not afraid of anything he can do, or you, or anyone else. What's that? Your heart beats like a trip hammer. I must warn you of this high state of nervous tension. What's that noise? Stepping against the window. Now, my dear Laura, if you want me to help you, you must tell me what it is you fear. I told you I'm not afraid of anything. I know what's going on here. Someone's trying to scare me out, but it won't work, see? Here I am, and here I'll stay until I rot. I'm afraid there's more truth in that than you suspect. Hmm. Laura, I must ask you not to cause Father any more trouble. I don't want you threatening him, you hear? You too. You're so cute. I'm sure you want to be alone. You're not going to make him pay for my mistake. What are you going to do about it? I'd like to. You'd like to choke me, wouldn't you, Ward? You haven't got the nerve. Here. This is the only thing you ever gave me. You can have it back. She's right. I gave her this when we were married. It's the only gift that ever passed between us. Ward, what do you propose to do about Laura? What can I do? She won't leave me. She won't give me a divorce. Well, things can't go on this way, you know. Dad, what is the matter with her? What do you think is wrong? I don't know. She wasn't this way until she began getting those letters from abroad, you remember? Yes, it had something to do with those letters. But you would have thought that when they stopped coming that... What is it, Elizabeth? There's a patient, Doctor, a Mrs. Williams. Williams? That's the name she gave, and she's decked out like she's going to a horse show. I can't see anyone today. Ask her to make another appointment. Dad, please don't let this happen. Interfere with your practice. Oh, very well. Send her in in a few minutes. Sure, Doctor. Oh, yeah. That Bill Raymond's waiting. Do you want to see him? Who's he? That private cop who's always hanging around, just hoping somebody gets murdered. <laughs> oh, yes. He's probably come for his check. Take care of it, will you, Ward? Yes. A little bit. Yes. This for you. Gee. Thanks, Mr. Roy. But this belongs to Mrs. Van E, doesn't it? Not anymore. It's all yours. She won't get sore, will she? I don't want to have any trouble with her. You know how she is. I know. We all know, Lilibet. I want to thank you for your patience. Run along now, Lilibet. Yes, Doctor. You made a fatal mistake, my boy, in marrying Laura. Yes, I know. But you don't suppose I'm going to stand for it forever, do you? No, I don't. And I don't think it will be necessary. Do you have a plan? I think it will be better if you leave everything to me. From the day a mysterious caller came to see Dr. Van E. Oh, yes, I remember now, Mrs. Williams. I spoke to you this morning on the telephone. I'm sorry, but I can't tell you any more now than I told you then. Oh, naturally, Doctor. I did not mean to imply that there were any abnormal goings on here. I assure you, that is not, Mrs. Williams, nor will there be. Nevertheless, Doctor, the way you were described to me, and the way your place was described to me, I am certain that I am in the right place. May I ask from whom you obtained these descriptions? From a friend, Doctor. A mutual friend. Well, wait, ma'am. The woman I love. Can't we be friends? Stop tracking your big flat feet after me wherever I go. I've got things to do. Oh, gee, it's wonderful just to see you around, busying yourself, the little housewife. I never knew the cop who didn't love to stand around and watch other people work. Mrs. Williams, it's obvious from your conversation that you've come into possession of certain facts concerning my past. I know of only one person who could have given you that information. And it was my belief, yes, 
even my hope. That person was dead. But let me say that even if that person were alive, I should not submit to blackmail from you or from anyone else. You show great courage, Doctor, for one in your unusual position. There has been no question of blackmail. I came here seeking your cooperation, which you have refused to give. So, let us call the matter closed. Thank you. Au revoir, Doctor. Then came this sinister pair. If you had waited another second, Indigo and I should have kicked the door in. Yes, sir. Sir? There is an air of inquiry about you that immediately offends my deepest nature. There is something suggesting Scotland Yard, the French Sûreté, the Italian Carabinieri, the Turkish Polisai, and other minions of the law. Short, sir, I think you're a cop. Yeah, how'd you know? I believe I'm in the home of Dr. Joseph Van E. Yes, sir. I mean, sirs. Oh, do not be polite to Inigo. He's only offended by it. Run along, Inigo. Make yourself at home. We got a nice tree in the yard, but it ain't got no coconuts. <laughs> My little friend Inigo is deaf and dumb. He cannot hear and he cannot speak. But he reads the lips. And I would advise you to say nothing to annoy him. For his temper is short, indeed. This, I presume, is Dr. Vanille's private office. Yes, sir. But I really should announce you. My dear girl, if I allowed myself to be announced, I doubt I would be received anywhere. I'm sorry, really I am, but the doctor won't see anybody without an appointment. Appointment? I have had an appointment with him these 20 years. He will see me. Doctor, doctor, it's not on My dear doctor, Truthfully, can it be said that your house is your castle, protected by your countless slaves? So it is you, Leonard. I was warned you might appear like one of your own illusions out of nowhere. My dear Joseph, you have not changed a bit. Have you met my friend, Mr. Raymond? Raymond? Oh, Raymond! No doubt a relative of the great magician of the same name. Mr. Raymond is our private patrol officer. He keeps an eye on the premises for us. And other comings and goings. A very good idea, my dear Joseph. To have a private bodyguard that you beck and call. Well, you fellas are all friends, I can see that. Oh, yes. Old friends. Well, then maybe you'd like to be alone to talk over old times. A very good suggestion. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. I won't be far away, Doc. <clears throat> well, so long, Mr. Leonide. Don't pull any more little men out of your hat. <laughs> well, Leonide, what brings you to me after all this time? The long arm of coincidence, my dear Joseph. Simply the long arm of coincidence. Aren't you glad to see me again? No, I can't say that I am. You with your foreign background and I, what are we to in common? Always truthful, cousin Joseph. As when you were young men, you might have said no and saved your career. But you prefer to tell the truth and ruin yourself. What do you want here, Leonide? A few days' hospitality, my dear Joseph. Nothing more. 
Is that too much for one cousin to ask of another? Remember, we agreed not to think of each other as cousins again, me and I. By God, my dear Joseph. And I'm willing to forget. And I suggest that you do the same. You've grown older, Leonid, but there may be something in what you say. I don't want to hold a grudge. But don't do anything that will make me regret my action. You have my promise. Now, if you will show me to my room. Oh, I should say, I have a traveling companion from whom I am inseparable. Who? Inigo, a dwarf. One of the little men. He became very much attached to me when he lost his master. You do not object. What good would that do? How true. Very well. You may have the room next to my daughter-in-law. I know you like that. Oh, yes. The lady, who I am told, has an utmost horror of having her eyes blindfolded. A phobia of most interesting origin, I dare say. Something to think about. That night, my husband questioned Leonard about my past. Cousin Leo. Oh. My dear Ward. How flattering that you remember me. Well, how could I ever forget you? What are you doing here? A chance visitor, my boy. I wanted to see the old homestead again. You've seen Father? Yes, and he received me with open arms, in a manner of speaking. I don't mind telling you, you came at a very bad time. We're, uh, you're having some trouble. My uh, boy, trouble and I are like this. I presume you refer to the charming lady in the room next to mine, your wife, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, Laura, I have met her, but I'm looking forward to the pleasure. I'd like to talk to you for a moment. All right. Perhaps you can help us. By doing what, my boy? You've been everywhere. You were caught in Europe during the war. I'd like to show you something. You may be just the person I'm looking for. If I can be of any service. Did you ever hear of a dance team called Renee and Lorette? I don't think so, my boy. And then again, there must have been such a team. Look. dance of the green mask in the green room in Paris. In the green room. Yes. Oh, uh, the face of the man does seem slightly familiar. May I ask, where have you got this photograph? I, uh, 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 the mate, Lilibet, found it in Laura's room and turned it over to me. Oh, well, my boy, I'm afraid I can't help you. I played the green room on several occasions, but never with these people. In fact, I don't seem to remember them at all. And I appeared in many clubs during the occupation. I'm sure the girl behind the green mask in this picture is Laura. How can you be sure? Who can ever be sure what's behind the mask? If the people in this photograph could suddenly come to life. I'd like to know who the man is. It can be anyone, my friend. Anyone. In this makeup, it might be even I. I wish you wouldn't joke about it. This is very serious, of course. But let us say you found out who the man in the photograph is. What then? I have an idea that if the man in this picture were to show up, I'd find out I wasn't married to Laura at all. Hmm. Think over what I've asked you. It'll be to your advantage. Oh, certainly, my boy. I will give it every consideration. And perhaps, something will occur. Who knows? Don't you want to leave the photograph with me uh, for my further study? It might be the very incentive that my memory needs. No thanks, sir. I'll keep it. As you wish.
surprise was in store for me the following morning. Who is it? It's me, ma'am. What do you want? The afternoon mail. He wanted to know when it arrived. Was there anything for me? Yes, ma'am. Put it under the door. I can't. It's a package. What's in it? I don't know. It's against postal regulations to open other people's mail. That's never stopped you before. I'd like to know what you mean by that remark, ma'am. Oh, shut up and get out. Don't you want me to help you open No, it? I don't. Get out. It's addressed to you in green ink with a warning. Look out for the man with the green mask. <laughs> You don't understand. I'm supposed to be here. That's what I'm being paid for. Paid? Yeah. You see, I'm Bill Raymond, private cop in this neck of the woods. I was hoping we'd have a little murder or something happen around here so as I could solve it and get my old job back at Sentinel Homicide. Nothing personal, of course. Who told you to say these things to me? Well, nobody. Nobody said nothing to me. I, I was just waiting around outside to see Dr. Van Lee and I heard you yell. So you're a friend of that crazy doctor and his son. Crazy? I, I wouldn't exactly say that, ma'am. The doc's a pretty good egg. You wouldn't want anyone to say you was crazy, even if you... You can go back and tell him I'm not afraid of being murdered by you or them or anyone else. No, I don't guess you are, ma'am. Still and all, if, if you was to get murdered and, and I was to find out who done it, it'd be kind of a break for me. That don't, that don't be, be the kosher. I wouldn't say that to you, lady, even if I knew what it meant. Now, will you get out? All right, all right. I can take a hand. Nice little bedroom companion you've got there. Get out. I'll go, I'll go, but don't think I'll come running next time you yell. I'll know it's a fake. I became afraid and my mind started to crack. Melancholy baby, where are you? Where'd you get that box? I don't know what you're talking about. You lying little snoop going through my things. What'd you do with the picture? Where is it? I didn't see it. That's the last time you put your hands on me. I'll give you one more chance, and then I'll... I told you I don't know what the picture is, and I don't know what you're talking about. It's been you all the time going through my things, opening my mail, rapping on my door at night. Now you're blaming me. I've never touched anything of yours. You've got my robe on now. Where'd you get that? I was just trying it on. Mr. Ward gave it to me. He said you didn't want it anymore. I'll tell you when there's something I don't want. <laughs> oh, shut up. It's only a dummy. Uh, a dummy? Where'd you get that thing? I suppose you're going to tell me you don't know anything about that either. <sighs> oh, I bet it was in the box. In the box I brought up for you, that's what. There were no stamps on it. How did it get in the mail? I don't know. The doorbell rang, and I thought it was the mailman. I opened the door, and it was sitting there on the stoop. You're lying. No, I'm not. I don't mind telling a lie now and then, but I'm not lying now. Honest. You're trying to scare me out. I'm not leaving. No. But I am. You come here. You and Mr. Ward are pretty thick, aren't you? Thick? Yes, thick like your head. He's fallen over someone else. Who is she? I don't know. It's not me. I know it isn't you. 
I know all the signs. He's fallen in love with some simple-faced men. There's always a way to get even with them. I've got to find that picture. Otherwise, they won't know what he looks like. I've got to send it to the police. He won't dare touch me. Who do you mean, the man in the picture? Have you seen him? Maybe I have, and maybe I haven't. Maybe I saw him go behind the thicket, or through the wall, or under the house. He's here in the house? Yes. I let him in. I let him in. He was waiting outside to get you, Miss Laval. Miss Laval. There's nothing safe from your prying eyes, is there? You think you know everything, don't you? I know why you're afraid, and I know what you've done. No, I'm not so sick. I'm not as thick as you think I am, Miss Laval. That head's supposed to be you. Kind of a calling card. I'll remind you that. Why, well, you! Excuse me, lady. Oh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Where are you hiding? Get that, Raymond. Miss Fanny chucked it at me like I was a pass receiver for a football team. And I'm all out of practice. Let me see it. This comes from a group of anatomical specimens that was locked in a room in the cellar. How did you happen to get it? That's what I'm trying to tell you. There I was, outside her door, strictly minding my own business, understand? Listening at the keyhole. I don't think that belongs in the realm of your duties, Raymond. But, Doc, there were screams inside. You've got to admit it's within the longitude of my profession to make with an investigatory reaction there, too. What am I saying? I don't understand how his head got from its locked room in the cellar. Well, the way I heard it, it was sent to Mrs. Van A. That was rather a gruesome practical joke. Why, your anatomical locker hasn't been open for ages. I think you once told me you'd lost the only key to it. I know. There is no key to my knowledge. My that thing didn't walk out of the room by itself. Hardly. Doc, I'm worried. What about, Raymond? Well, now, take this head business. The whole thing don't seem hardly serious to me. I think that if it's all the same to you, I better be checking along to other duties. You're not afraid, are you, Raymond? Who, me? Scared? <laughs> it's just that I don't think that there's going to be any murder here done after all. That's too bad. Well, it's not your fault, I guess. It's just not my lucky day, that's all. Thank you, Billy Beth. Oh, Miss Lily Beth, have you a little more coffee in the kitchen? What happened to the three gallons I already gave you today? Lily Beth. What you need is a good, strong, steady man. Who, who is always hanging around, tracking up my floors and things. What's that on your shoes? Looks like cobwebs from out of the cellar. What were you doing in the basement? It could have been the attic. Bill Raymond, you're holding out on me. What are you up to? Up to? Yes. Who asked you to go poking around in the cellar? It was in performance of my duty. What duty? What did you find? Absolutely nothing. That's what makes me so disgusted. Too bad about you. You know, Lily Beth, I think somebody around here is just kidding. They don't mean business at all. Why don't you just wait around and see? Say, if you've got any inside dope, I wish you'd tip me off. If I'm ever going to get back to Central and prove I'm a good detective, i got to have some clues. Yes, I was scared. Scared of my life. Say, Boris, are you scared yet? 
Your, is, your, uh, is your spine tingling? <laughs> so is mine. How about you out there? Hmm? Well, let's take a small break from the chills for a moment. And uh, I thought I'd bring out a few exhibits from the uh, museum here at Gargoyle Manor. Hmm? Uh, of course, it's got to be about Bela Lugosi. I, I found this particular little statue, ceramic. Uh, whew, it's, I guess it's been 30 years or, so, or more by now. I found this in a nice little shop. And he's standing in his coffin with his cape. And he's looking so much like Bela. And I just had to have it, you know, for the museum. And, of course, here lately, a few years ago, I got the honor of being able to find this wonderful mask, a head, the Bela Lugosi's head, and a mask that I can wear anytime I want to be like Bela, if possible. <laughs> I mean, who could be like Bela other than Bela himself? Exactly, right, Boris? Exactly. <laughs> anyway, I have many other things here in the museum about Bela. There's pictures, there's books, there's films, there's posters. Uh, all sorts and all kinds of different and wonderful things about Bela and so many other monsters as well. So, anyway, I thought I'd share that with you for a moment and get yourself uh, up to standards so that you're not quite so shocked when we go back into the rest of tonight's feature starring Bela Lugosi and George Zucco. Hmm? <laughs> Let's go. I expected big things of that ghoulish looking guy, but he ain't delivered neither. I should say in a way you were entitled to expect big things from him. Leo was once confined in this house when it was an institution for the insane. Nerves, you know. Do tell. Well then, he must know his way around the place, huh? I understand why he was here. He engineered an immense number of secret passages through which the guards could keep an eye on the inmates at night. Finally, he took one of these passages into the outside world, and we heard later he'd been seen in Europe. Ah, Europe. That's where history is being made today. Gee, I'd love to travel and... Well, perhaps you'll have an opportunity someday. Now, if something don't happen around here pretty soon to make me famous. <sighs> that Lily Beth. I've been trying to get a cup of coffee off of her all day. She don't care what happens to my metabolism. Metabolism. That's a good word. I wonder what it means. Operator. I want the police right away. But, hon, don't you want me around to protect you? That indigo guy might... Yes, but who's going to protect me from you? Lily Beth. My wild Irish rose. I just live for the day when I can take you out of all this. When I can slave and, and get you the luxuries in life. Gee, I'd gladly work my fingers to the bone to, to buy you expensive motor cars and furs and, and jewels and and things, and, and serve you breakfast in bed. What's the matter with me? Am I crazy? Yes, and I'd hate to hang by my neck until you got me all those things. Yeah, you might get a little blue in the face. Still and all, all I gotta do is to find myself one slightly murdered body, and I'm in. Stop looking at me. Oh, Lily Beth, sometimes I think I'm not getting anywhere with you. What do you think? I think you've got a good idea there. All right, all right. You'll be sorry someday when you see my picture in the paper. <laughs> Wait and see. Hey, Lily Pat, why don't you answer the doorbell? Maybe that indigo guy wants in. The doctor ain't home. You'll have to call some other time. Don't be silly. Uh, don't say I didn't tell you. Close the door on your way out. Hey, wait a minute. Well, if it isn't Bull Raymond. Shh. 
Jerry. You trying to ruin me? Ruin him. Come here, Paul. Meet Miss Cornell. How do you do, I'm sure. Likewise. How do you happen to be out with him? Cute, darling, don't you think? Flat at both ends, head and feet. You've heard me speak of him? Paul Raymond. Bill Raymond, if you please. Mr. Terry Lee, you so-called reporter. How do you happen to be out with a dish like this? Jane Cornell. Good for dull days in a man's life. Mr. Raymond. Oh, yeah, I remember. Terry told me about the time you shot up the dressmaker's dummy. Huh? Yeah, he said you closed in on what you thought was a murderer, but it turned out to be the dressmaker's dummy and you shot it full of holes while the real murderer got away. <laughs> <laughs> My pal. So this is where you've been hiding after they kicked you off for that fiasco, huh? Bull, Bill, I mean. What are you doing here? Can't a man rehabilitate himself in peace? Here I come, looking for an honest crime around here so I can solve it and get myself back to Central. And you come yeah. along and... Where's the body, Bull? Bill? There ain't no body. That's the trouble. No, no, let's keep it friendly. Friendly? What do you mean? Let's have it. Who killed who and why? Are you kidding? Did somebody get knocked off around here? Look, I don't like to be kidded either. Where is it hidden, Sherlock? Oh, Terry, you've been on the police beat so long that... Uh... Now listen, Bill, you know me well enough to know I wouldn't come out here just for the ride. Not when I could be, um... It just so happens there was a call to the police. It came from out here. And I happened to be there when it came through. Miss Cornell happens to be the operator. So she tipped me off. Told me the line had gone dead. So I smell the story and here I am for an exclusive, you see what I mean? What's in that? Well, that's the doctor's consulting room, but there ain't nobody in there. I've been standing here for quite a spell. Open it up. Let's take a look. That's funny. The lights in here ain't almost never out. In you go. Never do that. I could get killed that way. Is that bad? Oh, so nothing's happened around here, huh? It's busted. There, see? <laughs> like I said, there ain't nobody here. Hey, cut it out, will you? You're making me dizzy. Well, sure, somebody stumbled over it and pulled it out of the wall. Could happen anywhere. <gasps> I must have shake hands with you, Bill. Step right up. Not me. You've seen it first. Doc! Raymond, did you try and kill me? Fuck why, Doc? Why should I do that? You ain't paid me for the last month yet. How long you been here? Now, let me see. I was going to make a telephone call when... Somebody conked you, huh, Doctor? Then rip the telephone wire off? Yes, I imagine that is about what happened. Who are these people? Well, they're all right, Doc. This is Terry Lee and uh, Miss Cornell from The Times. We don't want any reporters here. Nothing's happened. Look, Doctor, nobody ever wants reporters. But then something happens, and there they are. But nothing has happened. I fell and hurt my head. Oh, I see. Then you got up again, put yourself on the table, and got all nice and pretty in that shroud there. You won't get any story here. And now, if you'll excuse me, I have some work to do. Doctor, do you mind if we stick around for a while? Seeing that nothing's happened, well, uh, why not? Very well, you may stay for a while, but I warn you, if you make yourselves objectionable in any way, I'll have Raymond throw you out. Well, come on, you heard what the doctor said. He's busy. Get out of the office. Probably a pretty nice guy, caught in a tough spot. That's the way I see it. You wouldn't want me to tell him you got kicked out of homicide, would you, Bill, old boy? Shh. Oh, Terry, you're my pal. You know that, don't you? Would I kick you out? You would if you could, Bill. Now, why can't we have a little talk, quiet like? Well, if you just follow me in the parlor over here. Oh, me too, darling, me too. Darling knows everything about everyone, and that's how I learned. Good time. Uh -huh. I just did it discreet and lesson. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Baby, I'm going to miss you an awful lot when I grow tired of you. Now remember, you're just going to listen. Well, of course, darling. What else do I do when I'm with you? Sit down. Now, as I remember it, there was a singer at the Click Club who called herself Laura Laval. Didn't she marry young Ward Vanny a couple of years ago? Uh, 
I don't know nothing about it. Oh, yes, you do. It was just about the same time that you had that affair with the dressmaker's dummy. Oh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, now I remember, Terry. You're right. You're right. Uh, she was uh, down to the click club, and it was her that married Ward. Wasn't that on a bed of some kind? Well, uh, there was a party going on, and uh, somebody dared Ward to ask the singer to marry him. And he thought at the time it was a good gag, and he went along with it. That's right. He got pretty high and then popped the question at her. How romantic. I do love that. Hush, dear. L-I-S-T-E-N. Oh. Well, that's how it happened anyway. Ward woke up the next morning and found himself married solid. He'd asked her and she'd snapped him up. Oh, and they lived snappily ever after. I don't care. I think it was sweet. Darling. Couldn't I get you high sometime? And... Sweetheart, have you ever heard the old saying about little girls? What's that? Little girls should be seen and not heard. Now go on, powder your nose. All right. I think I'll be shoving along too. I... Now wait a minute. We're just getting started. We were talking about a singer who called herself Laura Laval. And pushed her way into this house for good reasons of her own. Gentlemen, I beg your pardon. I must tell you frankly, I have been eavesdropping. Professor Leonide, this is a reunion. My boy, you must forgive me. You seem to remember me. But I do not recollect you. When was it? What was it? Oh, Professor, it was a long time ago, and I was a kid up in the balcony in Albany. Yes? When you brought down the house with great feats of ledger domain. Oh. You remember, Professor? That was the night that the box office receipts disappeared, just like magic. Uh, uh, part of the act, my boy. Just a part of the act. <laughs> it's a pleasure to meet one of my youthful admirers. Terry Lee of the Central City Times. Oh, the press? Well, it's nice to have known you. Wait a minute, Professor. What's your hurry? Are you afraid I might bring up the subject of those certain unfortunate recent connections of yours? Shut in the dark, my boy, I'm sure. And I will ignore it. Of course. And this young lady, no doubt a companion of yours. Jane Cornell, my fiance. Delighted. Likewise, I'm sure. Delightful. And I would suggest to take very good care of her. Miss Lee. Oh, I haven't had a chance to talk to him yet, Mrs. Van Eve. Never mind, I'll tell him myself. Darling, I met her upstairs and I told her all about you and that you know everything about everyone. Thank you very much, dear. Welcome to your living room, Mrs. Van Eve. Thank you, but it isn't my living room. I understand you're not unaware of my position in this house. Well, uh, maybe you can tell us about it. I'm being kept a prisoner here against my will. I'm alone and friendless. I'm sorry. Why haven't you called the police? They've done nothing but to call for the police. They have kept me penniless, but I can't leave. I understand. They're trying to destroy my mind, Mr. Lee. By innuendo and indirection, they're trying to make me believe I've done something dreadful in the past. That I'm to be the victim of some horrible vengeance. You know best about that. I'm innocent, Mr. Lee. I've done nothing. Now, this doctor's brought some stranger here with these tricks and illusions to further make me you believe. You mean the professor and his little, uh... Yes. You must help me, Mr. Lee. Laura, it's so good to see you downstairs again after all these days being locked in your room. You know perfectly well why I've remained locked in my room. Lord, this is Mr. Lee of the Times, the gentleman I told you about upstairs. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, look here, Mr. Lee. We don't want any more of that front page splash stuff such as I got when I married Laura. Your wife's been telling us that she's being kept here under constant threat. She's out of her mind. See what I mean, Mr. Lee? They don't overlook a single chance to put it in my head that I'm crazy. Perhaps I can explain, Mr. Lee. We don't believe there's anything wrong with Laura now. But we are sure something will happen to her mind if she continues to live under this strain. Just as I told you, they're behind us. Can't I make that clear to you? They spend all their time trying to terrify me. They write me letters of green ink. They send me dummy heads wrapped in green paper. Anything to frighten me so I can't sleep. I can't think. The only thought in my head is that I'm going to be killed. These are very serious charges, gentlemen. And I might say it'd make a perfect front page splash. Well, if you dare print a word about those ravings of my wife. Don't do anything to make me think they aren't ravings, Mr. Van E. He said 
to put the blindfold on, and you will know the truth. No! What's wrong with her, Doc? Quiet, Raymond. You don't mean that she's dead, Raymond. Then I knew that he was here. She's coming out of it, but she's in an advanced state of shock. Maybe necessary to administer sedative. That's intended to shut her up. I'd like to hear her do some more talking, Doctor. If her mind is allowed to dwell upon what's happened, that may be the breaking point. Well, you've got all the answers. Look here, Lee, I don't like your tone. If you have any insinuations to make, make them to me. Okay, I will. Suppose you and I talk this over downstairs. I don't recognize your right to question me. However, if it'll make you leave father alone. Bill, hmm? fix yourself a chair right outside the door and don't leave him till I get back. Sure, sure. But what about Lily Pat? Don't she write nothing around here? Now, Lee, first I'd like to see your credentials. You're busting here saying you're a reporter. That's the old turn the tables gag, Vanny, but if it'll make you any happier, take a look. All right, you're a reporter. But I still don't understand how you and the young lady got the news about our troubles. Do you really believe that story, Lee? Do you in your right senses really believe that we are keeping Laura prisoner here? That's what the lady says. She said that nonsense. Nothing would please me more than if she got out. Look, I don't get any of this stuff, Vanny, but there's a tricky deal going on around here, and I intend to sit in on it. Too bad I can't flash the city desk to make ready for a front page replay. Yes, isn't it? Either your wife is the victim of a well-plotted program of persecution calculated to drive her insane, or she's the uh, witch you say she is. You are the fellow with the nose for news. What does it tell you? It tells me that right now I'd like to know where your disappearing relative is. Get back, you fool. What's out there? I have a right to know. Don't see anything. What was it? It isn't possible. It isn't possible, of course. What do you see out there, Lee? I've had enough of this. Come on. Are you nervous, Miss Cornell? Oh, no. I think it's very exciting. Well, Professor, I thought I just saw you outside, banging at the moon. You disturbed your sleep. Where have you been? How will you start acting normally for a change? You're bringing suspicion upon all of us. I, my boy? What have I done? Suppose you tell us. Has no one arranged to silence you yet, Mr. Lee? What a pity. I don't silence very easy, Professor. And it'll take a lot more than what you've done to her. Do you suggest that I had a hand in that poor girl's unfortunate demise? Why don't you behave yourself, Professor? Mr. Van E here has the right idea. You're just gumming up the works. I did my humble best. Who are you working for? What do you expect to get out of it? I'm charging a debt, Mr. Lee. A debt contracted many years ago. Now, are you any wiser than you were a moment ago? No, but I'm beginning to get a general idea. By the way, how's that little girl of yours? I hope fervently that nothing happened to her. She would look so beautiful lying here. Look, Professor, I may not have been very smart in bringing Miss Cornell here, but if I thought you had any plan to do that... Why do you persist in making me the villain, Mr. Lee? Yes? Then, then it started to 
Tommy. What started the talk? I don't know. That thing. Now, look. Let's get back to the beginning. I left you here with Dr. Vanny. Yeah, and then he gave Mrs. Vanny a shot with a long needle. Never mind that. All right. Then he said, would I sit with Mrs. Vanny? Okay, okay. Where is she now? Who? Mrs. Vanny. Where did she go? That's just what I asked you, Janie. Well, she was right here. Then Dr. Van E went out. Then what happened? Well, oh, then Bill Raymond came in. Oh, that's great. The two of you in the same room at the same time. How did you communicate with each other? Sign language? Oh, I don't care. All you do is make fun of me. I didn't ask to come to this, this whatever it is. Oh, yes, you did, dear. Don't you remember? You said you wanted to see what the life of a reporter was like. Don't forget, Mr. Lee, one must not expect too much of certain types of mentality. Shut up, Bill Raymond. I remember you when you couldn't even make your ex. Oh, I want to go home. We can't go home, darling. We've got to get a story. Why? You don't understand. Yes, I do. Why do we have to get the story? Who cares? Oh, she's got you there. All right. Now, you tell me, what happened to you? Me? Oh, well, you said to stay outside the door. And I pulled up a chair. That's right. She was inside the door and you were outside. Then, then come that, that odor of heavenly perfume. That was an early man. It was sweet and penetrating, like, like an ancient drug. And I felt kind of sleepy like. Oh, so sleepy. At last he had me under his power. There must be a button or a gadget of some kind around here. Two o'clock, almost deadline for the nine o'clock final. Oh, Terry, what makes you think there's anything behind them walls? I've got a sneaking suspicion that the professor uses them for a disappearing act. I wish Lily Beth was here. Take me a cup of coffee. Well, she's right over in the doctor's office. Why don't you ask her? Poor Lily Beth. I kind of hinted that all I needed was a murdered body, but I didn't think she'd take it personal. Will you stay with those walls? I've been around him three times, Terry. The thing I can't understand, if the professor was down here when the trouble was going on upstairs, he just had to be two different guys in order to have a hand in it. Oh, Terry, let's figure it out in the morning, huh? What's that? Nice sleep I've had in a long time. All right. Now that you're good and rested, let's see if we can understand what happened upstairs. Well, do you think it had something to do with that picture, maybe, that Lily Beth found in Mrs. Van E's room? What picture? Oh, the one with the couple with the two masks, you know, the, like we found, like that mask. Who has the picture now? Well, young Van E, I guess. That's the point. Where has Mr. Van E been since his wife's disappearance? Well, him and his old man are sleeping. I guess they got some sense. No, oh, no, no. I've already checked that, and they haven't slept in their beds tonight. Wake up! I refuse to answer. On the grounds that my attempt to incriminate or degrade me. <laughs> my unconscious mind. <laughs> now, look, Bill, please stay awake for a while. Now, look, tell me, what happened when you smell that sweet odor in the hall upstairs? No, oh, it smelled lovely. Lovely, that's all I can remember. And Dr. Van E had already left Laura's room, is that right? Yeah, he'd gone out and he said good night and, and, and he had uh, given her some sedative or something that he said would take care of her in the morning and then he went down the hall to his own room. And then you fell asleep? Yeah, no, I just kind of dozed off a little. <clears throat> like this. Here's your coffee, sir. Terry, 
That's a dirty trick. Stay on the other side of that window. What for? Take a look. I'm looking. What do you see? Lily! Oh, gee, this ain't natural. Who are you talking to? The woman I love. Poor little angel. Try and speak to me. She can't hear you. What was you doing outside? You're supposed to be dead. Now you stay right here, honey. I gotta catch that guy in the shrubbery. Oh, gee. What are you doing to me, Louie Bat? I got work to do. Louie Bat, be reasonable, will you? If you don't cooperate, I'll never get back to Central. Never mind, Raymond. Take care of Lily Beth. Lily Beth! Yeah, that's who it was. I opened the door and she fell right in my arms. Like she had something special to tell me. You notice that fragrance about her? But to think this wilted flower was once even as you and I. Take her back into Dr. Van E's office. What's she doing wandering around? She's supposed to be a corpse. What happened to that guy outside? Never mind that. You found her. I never knew she was lost. I missed her. I missed her from my office. Will you please take her back? What are you going to do? Yes, Doctor, and what have you been doing? We've turned this house upside down trying to find you. Hardly that, young man. If you'd done that, you would have found me. Now, Raymond, we can't allow this girl to remain in this condition any longer. But what can you do? She looks like a perfect sniff to me. Bring him into my office. Oh, Doctor, this may not be any news to you, but your daughter-in-law has disappeared. Oh, how dreadful. But let us say somewhat overdue, eh, Mr. Lee? You don't seem very surprised to hear about it. Young man, when you've been devoutly praying for something to happen, you accept your good fortune without question. I thought that probably you might be able to throw some light on the subject. That's right, Raymond. Leave her there. There's absolutely nothing wrong with her. Huh? And you mean I've been pining away for nothing? She was put in a deep hypnotic sleep, that's all. But why? Why, Doc? Who done it? It was done so that she would obey certain orders that were transmitted to her. Oh. If that's true, then why did you declare her dead? I had my own good reasons. Would you give me one reason why you like to go around getting hit on the head? That must become a little monotonous. Mr. Lee, are you sure that you saw what you thought you saw? Well, I'm not blind. I might be getting a little dizzy in this madhouse. Doctor, morning isn't very far off. And when the police get here, you've got an awful lot of explaining to do. You're in this up to your neck. By morning, let us hope no explanations will be necessary. Everything will have explained itself. Poor little sleeping beauty. Do you suppose someone thought she looked weak-minded and picked her out to carry out his commands? Well, that's not always the case, Raymond. If Leonide and I were here, we could settle this case very quickly. Gentlemen, it is my peculiar misfortune to always be in a position where I may eavesdrop. How can I be of service, Cousin Joseph? Oh, Professor. Ask me no questions, my friend, and I will tell you no lies. Leonide, you could undo certain mischief that has been done this girl. I know you can help if you will. I could, my dear Joseph. But I will not bring down the rest of the unknown madman who is loose about these premises. It is a matter of self-preservation. I had nothing to do with hypnotizing this girl. I have an idea that she may have already carried out the unknown's orders and that he no longer needs her. Nevertheless, my dear Joseph, you must excuse me. Just a minute, Professor. I wonder what would happen, Professor, if in connection with your sudden reappearance here, Somebody dug up the old story of why you swindled Dr. Vanny and then ran off and let him take the rap. I will not be blackmailed, Mr. Lee. 
And I observe again that you're a young man who knows too much for his own good. And I would also like to know where you obtained all this information. You're extremely young to have your fingertips on events of 20 years ago. I have a memory like an elephant. I never forget something once I hear it. I'm a sharpie, Professor. As every one of you will admit before morning. Now, Doctor, I'd like to bore you with a few questions. I wouldn't mind, young man, if you had the slightest idea of what you were looking for. Maybe if we start back to the time around midnight, when you administered what you call a sedative to your daughter-in-law. Are you inferring that I had anything to do with Laura's disappearance? Why do you keep evading the issue, Doctor? You know you'll have to confess when the police get here anyway. I would remind you, young man, that you're making a direct accusation. And I refuse to answer. Look, I want the facts and I want them now. Let's cut out the Mulberry Bush routine. Listen, Bill, you're supposed to be a cop and you want to get back to homicide. Help me make the doctor loosen up. He knows a lot more than he's telling. Well, sure, I'll help, Terry, but first let's get Lily Beth out of this. Maybe she can tell us something. Yes, Mr. Z, it seems to me that you're not too anxious to have Lily Beth restored to consciousness. What do you hear, Doc? Her heart's in a very depressed condition. Someone's been giving her orders by mental telepathy. Hey, could I learn to do that? Suppose a Lily Beth was in the kitchen. Could I telegraph her a wish for a cup of coffee, huh? Perhaps, Raymond. Someday, when we have a little time, I'll indicate the principles of hypnosis to her. Thank you. Well, Joseph. The principle of hypnosis isn't as simple as you make them believe. It requires a long and patient study. But I will risk the rest of the unknown. For I see you truly love this child. And for your sake, for your sake, I shall use my knowledge. Oh, gee, thanks, Professor. You're solid. For doing it, I think my left hand. What are you stopping me for? Professor, put her back to sleep. It's better that way. What have you been doing to me? Me? What have I been doing? Yes, what have you been doing? You've got to learn me that hypnotism trick. It's my only chance. Tell me, Lily Beth, what happened? Well, I, I can't seem to remember it. It all seems like a dream. Did you see anyone? No. But I do remember a perfume, a sweet odor. Yes, yes, go on. What is it? Is it Halloween? No, it isn't. Then why was that green face bobbing up at the window? What? Yeah, a green face, just like the one I saw in Miss Van E's room. You saw a green face in Mrs. Van E's room? Well, yes, darling, that's what she was shooting at. I mentioned it to you, but you're so scatterbrained. Yes, dear, I'm scatterbrained. Does your mind feel rested now and everything after your nap? Mm-hmm. That's a good girl. Now, come on, tell me, what happened? Oh, don't yell at me. I can tell you just how it happened. We were alone in the room, and Laura was going to sleep. And then she said, oh, take away the bandage. And I said, what bandage? And then she said, oh, don't shoot me. I didn't mean to do it. And then oh, the room got awfully black. I think somebody must have turned off the light. Just like that. Go ahead. You're doing fine. Well. Yeah, the lights had already gone out. Uh-huh. And the room got awfully dark. You've already said that. Think hard now. You saw a green mask. It came out of the wardrobe. Like a moth? Yes, darling, just like a moth. Oh, how clever of you. It was just like a great big moth, and it flew around and Please around don't around make yourself any dizzier than you are. Now tell me the rest of it. Oh, well, I just don't see how you could remember that it was like a great big moth. Did you see it? Was you hiding in the wardrobe, maybe? No. I wasn't in the wardrobe. Now look, Jane. Please, be yourself. No, I mean, don't be yourself. Just relax. Relax. Mr. Lee, just a moment. Where were you? Were you upstairs? No, I was down here talking with your son. And by the way, where is he? Here I am, Mr. Lee. What can I do for you? Will you stop it? 
Yes, I was listening outside the door. You haven't answered my father's question yet. Oh, come on, take it easy, take it easy. Maybe you can tell us where you've been, Mr. Vanny. Of course, you don't know anything about your wife's whereabouts. Oh, go on, tell him where she is. I want to go home. I'm hungry. Quiet, everybody, quiet! Laura! Don't. No, don't. Don't. Laura! She's under a hypnotic spell. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been an exciting night, and you all are deserving of some explanation and relaxation for the strange goings on. The guy who's doing the talking is behind the wall somewhere. Now you're getting smart, Sherlock. We introduce at this time the team of Lorette and Rene, as they appeared at the height of their success in the green room of the Paris Creole. Sure, the mask, the picture. Mademoiselle Lorette. Now I know who she is. Mademoiselle Lorette will now put a bandage over her eyes. The better to see the inner truth. Very good, Renee. Very good. Just like the old time. Would any member of the audience like to ask Mademoiselle a question? Come, Mr. Lee. You have been so full of questions up to now. I'm thinking, brother. We cannot keep Mademoiselle too long in this delicate mental balance. She has been under a great strain lately. Then I will ask the questions myself. Yes, Rennie, I'm at your command. Are you afraid now? No, I'm quite safe. Will you tell the truth? Yes. They came to me and said your partner, he of the magic feats and rare impersonations, is a spy. But we can't prove it. So we'll give you a million francs if you, Lorette, bring us that proof. Ah, now we shall know. You gave them the proof they wanted? Yes. They took him away to be killed? Yes. What was he to you, this man you betrayed? This man you sold to the enemy for money? He was my husband. When they told you he was to be executed, you sent this man a gift for his last moment before the firing squad. What was it? It was a green scarf for his eyes. Like the one you're wearing now? Yes. Why did you send it? It was my scarf. I wanted him to know I had betrayed him because I hated him. He was good and kind. But I hated him for the power he had over me. I see. That is your only defense you hated. You thought they shot him. You escaped to America. You thought you were safe. Then you found out he was alive and wanted revenge. Thank you, Mademoiselle Lorette. You may remove the bandage now. What do you see on the cloth, Mademoiselle? There's a hole in it. Yes. What else, Lorette? What else? There's blood on it. There's blood. I have come back. I am here. And I will have my revenge. No! No, don't touch me! Ah! Outside, under the window, you know where. Yes, he had his revenge. She's been living in mortal terror that he'd find her. Just a minute, lady. You ain't going nowhere. Well, if it ain't Mrs. Williams, come along with me. Come on, come on. You want me to slug you? Get inside. Hey, Terry, Terry, come here. Get a load of this. There's your man. <laughs> At last, I caught me a murderer. <laughs> You're wrong. I never laid a hand on her. Hey, my boy, you kept your promise to me. You said you wouldn't touch her. But she's dead, ain't she? And you ain't going nowhere till we find out what killed her. And you, Professor, you know too much for your own good. I'm holding you, too. Now you're getting smart, Bill. Well, Professor, I see you two know each other. Yes. Rene was my assistant. I taught him everything he knows. He went out for himself and became a success. Later, we met in a concentration camp. And here we are. A small world, Mr. Lee. A small world, indeed. 
caring. Isn't this the place where you get the marriage licenses? No, dear, this is the morgue, the morgue. Oh, darling, you say the cutest thing. The morgue? Oh! Now, never mind, dear, you just stay right here and nobody will get you. Oh, but... Uh... Well, Doctor, got anything to add to my story of the year? Who's this Renee? Renee was a husband. She turned him over for a sum. Figured the Nazis would take care of him, but he had ideas of his own. Look, Doc, was it murder? Do I finally get a break? Was she murdered? We're sending the report to the police. What was it saying? Ah, oh, come on, Doctor. Don't hold out on us. I didn't understand it at first, but I do now. There were no marks of violence on the body, and we found no internal disturbances. What does this all add up to, Doctor? Yes, let's have it. She was literally scared to death. Did you survive the film, my dear fiends? Hmm? We did, or more or less, we may not have. Boris and I can never tell. Our blood runs so cold. <laughs> what an ending. What an ending. Scared to death by a mask. <laughs> if my evilness, if I was to be scared to death by a mask. I have hundreds of them here at the museum. I don't know. <laughs> I could be scared to death over and over and over for a very long time. Hmm, that sounds like fun. We might should try it sometime, Boris. <laughs> well, my dear fiends, I hope you're even more revved up for Halloween even more than you were. Hmm? I mean, after all, ghost stories, and as in a sense, this was a ghost story. It was told by the dead, so she's either undead or a ghost, or both. <laughs> I hope you have uh, wonderful, unpleasant dreams. <laughs> right, Boris? So, until next time, as always, keep screaming. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't go away anywhere, my dear fiends. <laughs> you thought that was the end of the show. Oh, no, no. We have a very special surprise for you. Tonight's mystery second feature, the double feature, stars, monsters galore, Judd Hirsch, Marriott uh, Hartley, and John Shuck, just for a few, but more importantly, Frankenstein's monster, Count Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mummy, a ghoul, and more. For a feature called The Halloween That Almost Wasn't, or How Count Dracula Saved the World. <laughs> a special surprise just for you, and you, and you, and you. So, sit back and get ready as we go into tonight's Monster Movie Night double feature, second feature. <laughs> Good evening, my dear fiends. Good evening. <laughs> Are you ready for a tale of terror? Or how about a tale of Halloween, the one where Halloween almost wasn't? Or, as it also is known, how Count Dracula saved the world. <laughs> That's right, my dear fiends. Monsters and Halloween have been going together for a very long, long time. <laughs> and tonight's feature shows just such importance of monsters in Halloween. I mean, after all, the witch, the werewolf, the vampire, and the ghoul, along with new monsters such as Frankenstein's monster, hmm? How they got together, how they continue scaring us for Halloween and throughout the whole year. Ah, my dear fiends, let us go to tonight's feature, hmm? And see the Halloween that almost wasn't, or 
how Count Dracula saved the world. You almost frightened me to death. Thank you, Igor. We now bring you a special report from the Transylvania News Department. Be quiet! <coughs> Count Dracula has ordered the world's leading monsters to come to his castle immediately. This conference on the night before Halloween only confirms the rumor from an unimpeachable source that Halloween is in danger of disappearing forever. Oh, no more Halloween. Oh, say, it isn't so, Master. Of course it isn't so. Who could have started such a rotten rumor? Who knows what impact this will have on tiny tots all over the globe. That I have an exclusive interview with a man, well, a man that I can say is the most honest. Yes, if this rumor is correct, this means the end of Halloween. A beloved 2,000-year-old tradition. 2,000 years? Sure. Back in those days, people used to light bonfires to scare away the evil spirits. Nowadays, jack-o'-lanterns are supposed to do the same thing. Do you know why people got dressed up for Halloween? Because it was fun. No, for protection. They thought if they dressed up to look like an evil spirit, the other spirits wouldn't bother them. That's how the custom started. But we're still going to have a Halloween, though, aren't we? Let's find out. Who conceived this diabolical scheme? Some experts believe that Count Dracula himself is behind this threat to end Halloween. How dare they suggest such a thing? Halloween is my national holiday. And so, it is a sad possibility that Halloween, which got its name from All Hallows Day, may be receding from us forever. All Hallows Day? The first day in November used to be called All Hallows Day. And the night before was called All Hallows' Evening. And then they shortened it to Halloween. And so tonight, the ancient streets of Transylvania are wild with rumors about this gathering of monsters in Count Dracula's castle. Igor? Yes, master? My fellow monsters shall be arriving now. Make them uncomfortable until I make my big entrance. <laughs> Frankenstein creature. Learned any new dance steps lately? Watch this one.
From tropical Haiti, the king of the living dead, Zabar the zombie, at a ball. From Egypt, the mummy. The flying queen of Halloween, to me. For Out of my way, Shorty. I don't have to take this kind of treatment from anybody. Somebody's going to hear from me. <laughs> Let me tell you. What's the idea of waking me up in the middle of the night? Count Dracula will explain everything in just a moment. Wait! I believe I hear him coming now. Yes. I can see him clearly through the fog. Oh, boy. Oh, master. Oh, master. I forgot to open the window. Forgive me. It will never happen again. And I know how to make sure it never happens again. <laughs> and as for all of you, I have called you here tonight to warn you. You have exploited your monsterhood so much that you are no longer scary. People are laughing at you instead of shrieking. And now, someone has started the rumor that there is to be no more Halloween. And all of you are guilty, especially you. Shaving your beard and your hands just to make a razor blade commercial? How could you do such a thing? And you? Letting that movie influence you so much that now, instead of terrifying the countryside, what are you doing? You're tap dancing. I like tap dancing. Oh, you like tap dancing. I'll give you tap dancing. Tomorrow night is Halloween. And I command you all to be your old horrible selves. Especially you. Halloween cannot officially open without your ride over the moon. Now I'm warning you all. If anyone lets me down on this Halloween, you shall be replaced. Are there any questions? No. You have a question? I sure do. How soon can I be replaced? I quit. What? You quit? But you can't quit. Do you know what it means if you quit? I know, boss. I know you know. I want to know what she knows. It means no more Halloween. The end to a beloved 2,000-year-old tradition. But my mind is made up. I quit. Ah, so it was you who started the rumor that there would be no more Halloween, huh? You got it. But why would you do such a thing? Why? Because I can't stand being a witch anymore. I'm tired of all those ugly girl jokes. Tired of being feared instead of loved. Tired of getting less respect than you. And tired of taking orders from you. Why should you be the leader of the monster world and not me? Because! Because I am your superior. To the entire world, I am the king of the monsters. Can you ride over the moon on your broom on Halloween night? No? Then you're not more important than me. Well, what more do you want? It's all here on this little list. You call this a little list? Now you listen to me. No, you listen to me. If you want me to ride over the moon tomorrow night, you will agree to every condition on this list. I'm listening. Then, my picture replaces yours on the official posters and souvenir T-shirts of Transylvania. The T-shirts? Ah, it goes by big book. Two, you will publicly apologize for scaring your fellow monsters and promise to be sweet to us from now on. What? You want me, Count Dracula, to apologize for being terrifying and to be sweet? That would ruin my image. How could I do that? Three, I want equal authority with you as co-leader of the monster world. Agree to share my powers? Never! Never! OK, then we have nothing more to talk about. Two <laughs> Frankenstein, guard the door. The rest of you follow me. We must catch her before she leaves the castle. Oh, 
I'm got her. I've got her. <laughs> no, she'll never get away. <laughs> she got away. <laughs> Barricades herself in a castle. We may never get her out. Stand back. Hiya, baby. It's me, Count Dracula. Didn't think it was a hummingbird. Can't take no for an answer, huh? If you would only listen to me for a few minutes. You haven't got a few minutes. What do you mean? Any moment the sun's gonna rise, and if you're not back in your mausoleum, you're gonna be a dead duck. You're right. You won't get away. I'll catch up with you tonight. Geronimo! I hope we left the tomb door open. Igor always leaves the tomb door open. Uh oh. Igor, you did it again. How many times do I have to tell you? Keep my tomb door open at night. Closed in the day, open at night and closed in the day. Well, my dear fiends, <laughs> are you getting any ideas or more information about how we almost didn't have Halloween? Uh, ooh, let's just hope it's not a forbear of yet another such a event coming up this year. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Evil goodness forbid. <laughs> well, tonight's feature, how Halloween almost wasn't or... How Count Dracula saved the world. Hmm. Well, it's all about monsters and Halloween. And so I thought I would bring out for tonight some of my exhibits here at Gargoyle Manor, the Monster Museum. Hmm. For your perusal and enjoyment. Uh, let us start out with some of the older things. Hmm. Here we have Count Dracula himself, uh, glow in the dark. I believe by, I'm not sure, but it may be Amigo, but I don't really care where, who made it or where it's come from. All I care was that it's Count Dracula. I mean, there he is, fangs and all, even with his medallion and his wonderful, wonderful cape. Now, along with that, we have Frankenstein's monster. Ah, yes, indeed. Let's let's raise him up out of the monsterizer. There he is. Let's. Ah, I wonder if he's light-footed as well, <laughs> like tonight's uh, Frankenstein monster. He could sure cut a rug with that two-step, couldn't he? <laughs> well, anyway, we had the mon the Frankenstein monster, and we had a gizmo here that um, was called the monsterizer. Now, you would put him inside of it. You could also put Count Dracula in there, but I always like putting the Frankenstein monster in it because he looked so much more at home than Count Dracula did. Then you would turn a few knobs and push a few buttons and the light would come on and it would recharge his glow in the darkness. <laughs> this was an 80s toy. A wonderful, wonderful set that I have here back in the museum. Let's see. Well, you know, tonight's about monsters getting together and dancing and having fun and singing our national anthem. <laughs> That's right, the Monster Mash. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Once you're getting started, he never knows when to stop. <laughs> anyway, 
<laughs> they did the mash, and he'll stop in a moment. There we go. <laughs> I love that song, don't you? It's, a, it's an old favorite, especially around uh, this time of year from Transylvania. Now, coming up into the newer world, well, part of the older and newer world, this came out oh, a year or so ago with the Frankenstein monster again. And he's inside here uh, just chilling out with the electrodes. And let's see. There's something to be afraid of. Just some stitches. <laughs> And he likes to tell jokes, which is not bad. We all like to uh, joke or two once in a while. <laughs> That's sort of a trick or a treat. Now, coming up even further into our nowadays history, we've, I found these wonderful little toys connected to a Netflix um, TV show called Super Monsters. This is basically little baby monsters. And there's Count Drac. Little Drac and Little Woofy. <laughs> and oh, of course, we have Little Frankie. Uh, of course, we have to have Little Frankie son. Yes, and these little creatures are so much fun to watch, especially for the little ones. You know, we have to teach our young, well, when they're young, about our monster heritage, don't you think? Try not to scare them until they are ready to be able to scare others themselves. <laughs> well, my dear fiends, let us get back to tonight's feature. Hmm? That's right. How Halloween almost wasn't, or how Count Dracula saved the world. Let us go back to it right now. So it's a sad day here in Transylvania tonight. For unless the witch can be found in time and persuaded to take her broom ride over the moon at midnight, it means the end of Halloween. What's gonna happen, Mom? Are we gonna have a Halloween or not? It's all up to the witch now. And so I can say that the mood here in Transylvania is one filled with deep gloom and anxiety. For without Halloween, the future of the world's most famous monsters looks very bleak indeed. What's going to happen to us? What are we going to do? What are we going to... I'll tell you what we are going to do. We are going to the witch's castle. I have a plan. But we have to take her by surprise. So follow me and be quiet. Master. I know you're here. I just hope the witch doesn't know you're here. We're in luck. She's alone. Oh, Good. Right. Now, here's my plan. You three seize the witch and hold her while I quickly hypnotize her. Then she will do anything that I command her. And can't miss. She cannot escape. Unless she has some magic I don't know about. Oh, except for her broom. She has no magic. Good. All right, men. You all know what you have to do. At the count of three, we go in. At the one, at the two, at the three. monstrous naturally now I want you to close your eyes and relax close them a little bit more that's better soon you will grow sleepy 
and obey my every command. Over my dead body. Only at ease. <laughs> Come on, admit it. You underestimated my powers. And you underestimated my ancestors. <laughs> the witch has my magic, eh? Ah! Wait for me. On guard. <sighs> what do I do now? Master, believe me, they're just delusions. They can't harm me. Touché. Can't do me any harm, huh? Who did that, termite? Da! Ah! Oh, master, master, oh, oh. do something, do something. What can I do? If I can't bite them, I can't fight them. <laughs> Her broom. Great. We've got her. She's trapped in a room without her broom, somewhere at the top of the stairs. Are they gone yet? Yes. It's safe for you to come out now and protect my life. Follow me. <laughs> my feet hurt. Don't give me that. I happen to know they're not your feet. What did you have to bring that up for? Oh, never mind. It's almost 12 o'clock. We haven't got any more time. I can't hypnotize her through the door. I have to get inside, into the room. But how? How? I have an idea, Master. We all know you can turn yourself into a big bat. If you could turn yourself into a teeny tiny bat, you could squeeze through the space under the door. Before the witch even knew you were in the room, you change back into yourself and could hypnotize her. It's easy and nobody gets it. Igor, for once in your life, you have a good idea. Here goes. Nobody gets hurt, huh? I will get even with you for this, Igor, if it takes me a thousand years. And I know how to make you live that long. There must be another way to get into that room. Must be. I think there's another way to get into this room. I can see a window directly opposite this door. That window can be reached by walking along this ledge. All we need is a brave man. Igor. Watch out for falling gargoyles. <laughs> conditions. But I will never forgive her for this. And after tonight, all I will live for is revenge. Hello? What is it? I have decided to be generous. All I want to know is, are you meeting my conditions? 
Yes. My picture is on the posters instead of yours? Yes. And you'll share the leadership of the monster world with me? And you'll take me disco dancing every night? Disco dancing? I don't remember disco dancing. It's three minutes to twelve. Oh, now I remember. Let's see. What else? Please. It's getting late. Open the door. Don't rush me. I still haven't made up my mind. A girl can change her mind, you know. Oh, no, no, no. You wouldn't do that. Oh, yeah? I just changed my mind. I don't want to be a witch anymore. Nobody loves a witch. But it's almost midnight. You can't quit now. I have the night. Oh, shut up, Igor. Let me think. Stop moving around. I hear footsteps. I'm never going to ride over the moon again, and that's my final word. Never. Never. Please, Miss Witch, don't say that. Please. Dracula, don't you disguise your voice. You can't fool me. Please change your mind. If you don't, there'll be no more Halloween. No more jack-o'-lanterns and pumpkin pies. Worst of all, no more trick-or-treats. No more fun dressing up in costumes to make believe you are someone else. For free heaven's sakes, you look just like me. This is my favorite costume because of you. It is? Why? Because you are one of my favorite people. Love you just the way you are. All of the kids feel that way. You really love me? All right. I'll do it. And knowing you love me means more to me than any of his promises. Oh, then we can forget those silly conditions that you asked for. Not on your life. You're going to have to keep each one of those promises just the same. Starting with a disco party right after I ride over the moon. So long, kids. This ride is just for you. Some ending, eh, Boris? I mean, really having a disco ball for all the monsters. That is, that's not too bad. No, Count Dracula sure knew how to cut a rug. <laughs> Especially with our wonderful witchy poo there. <laughs> Him and her made a striking couple. <laughs> well, how about that film? Does it help you out with a little bit more of a monster heritage? that knowing that such things happened and that is part of our culture as much as it is a part of your culture as well. Humans and monsters together. I mean, after all, who could resist the little children's faces? 
Our dear good friend the witch certainly most could not. I mean, really, she in her eyes, she is most beautiful. And, well, in our eyes as well. Hey, boys, warts and all. <laughs> well, my dear fiends, I hope that these films tonight have revved up your juices for Halloween, which is to come in only a few weeks from now. <laughs> well... Get your pumpkins out, get your jack-o'-lanterns, <laughs> get ready for trick-or-treat, and we'll try to supply both tricks and treats here at Monster Movie Night. <laughs> I, Bobby Gum Monster, along with Boris T. Buzzard, saying to you, as always, keep screaming.